Hello, my name is Thomas Woolley and I'm a lecturer here in Cardiff University. And what I want to do is tell you a bit about my everyday research into mathematical biology. Because I'm a mathematician, first and foremost, I did it as an undergraduate, graduate, doctorate, postdoctorate, now I'm a lecturer. But in the third year of my undergraduate, I did a course in mathem mathematical biology and I really found what mathematics can do. It really changed my ideas because most people think mathematics is very abstract. You know, we deal with structures of thought, we work in infinite dimensional spaces, and that's all very true and it's all very beautiful. But when I saw a piece of mathematics that could explain how diseases spread through the population, how mathematics could tell us how to uh, develop, uh, fix developmental issues such as spina bifida, that really captured my imagination. And since then, I've, I've spent my career focusing on working with biologists using my mathematical techniques to answer questions that they're interested in. Because that's the whole point. I can do mathematics, I'm very good at mathematics, but I'm only as good as the biologists I work with. So what I want to do is now tell you about all the different applications I've worked on. Well, some, I certainly can't tell you about all of them, but we're going to be looking at breadth rather than depth. So one of the first things I worked on for my doctorate was the mathematics of pattern formation, absolutely beautiful branch of mathematics. And so what does it mean? It, it, it simply comes down to literal patterns, and it can be something as simple as the stripes on a zebra or the spots on a fish, all the way to the formation of your fingers. Because at the very beginning, you start out as a spheric leg. Sperm comes along, it hits it, it gives it a calcium wave, which we'll talk about later, and then over time, the cells develop into something that's very, very much not spherical anymore. But those cells aren't intelligent. They don't know, or they can't think. All they can do is use forces, push and pull on their neighbours. They can also react chemically with the internal of the cell and with their neighbours as well. So what rules must a cell be using to go from the highly symmetric spherical shape to what you see before you. And the breakthrough came in 1952 by a mathematician called Alan Turing. You may have heard him. The, there was a famous film recently, The Imitation Game, uh, starring Benedict Cumberbatch, where it shows his work breaking the Enigma Code in World War II. And this is the thing about Alan Turing. He's actually my personal hero because he really was a genius. He did so much mathematics. He, he, he was the father of computation before computers really existed. He worked to shorten the World War, it's estimated by two years. But one of his less well-known ideas, yet most cited papers, is his work on the chemical basis of morphogenesis. And that's simply a very complicated way of saying the maths of pattern formation. And it's an absolutely beautiful piece of work because it's so counterintuitive and again it shows you the genius that was Turing because he could see further than most people could. So his idea has two parts, reaction and diffusion, okay? And sounds complicated, but you actually know what these two parts are. Let's take diffusion. You, you know intuitively what diffusion is. If you put milk in tea, say, and you don't stir it, the, the milk will diffuse out. You don't end up with blotches or stripes of milk, the milk will spread. Again, with ink in water, the, the ink spreads out. You don't end up with patterns. You just end up with blue water if it's blue ink. So diffusion wipes out patterns. Not a great thing to add into a pattern form forming mechanism. The second thing Turing said we need is reactions. But he, he, said, he specified that the reaction should be stable. And what that simply means is that, let's say you have chemical A, you have chemical B, bam, you get chemical C. And that, that's really it. It, it. At the end, you get a uniform amount of chemical C. You, it doesn't produce spots or stripes. You just get chemical C. So again, thinking about it, it doesn't make sense. You have diffusion, which wipes out patterns. You have the reactions, which also don't produce patterns. So what could Turing have been thinking? Well, the critical thing was that Alan Turing in his paper said that if you connect the reaction to diffusion in just the right way, then you can produce patterns. And that's what I, what I worked on for my doctorate and still do, because like I say, it's so beautiful. The mathematics is so incredible that you can go from pure thought to simulating the creation of patterns. Beyond patterning, uh, I've done a bit of work on cellular blebbing. Now, you've probably never heard of this, but you don't worry, it's a really fun little piece of work. The idea is that if you, if you damage a muscle fibre, uh, the, the stem cells will 
pop out of the muzzle, run up and down, try and find the damage, heal the damage by dividing, lots of cells will divide and cure the, the damage. Great, we all want healthy muscles. But how they move is the, the really fun bit. We have collaborators in Reading who look at these cells and you have a spherical cell and it produces little blisters all over the cell and it uses these protrusions to run up and down the muscle fiber. So the first question from our collaborators was, can we understand this motion? And again, this comes back to the idea of diffusion. And what's amazing is one idea, the same mathematical idea, can give you a variety of different biological outcomes. So what we were looking at here was the cell doesn't know where it's going. It's producing lots of protrusions trying to find the damage, but it can't sense it in the experiments that the Reading guys were doing because there was no damage. So it should be moving randomly, which is the mathematics of diffusion, which we understand. So we said, if it is moving randomly, then it should move in a specific way. We compared it with data and correct, we understood how it was moving. Now, the next part of this work is to look at cells where we perturb its environment. How is the cell finding the damage? Because if we understand that, then maybe we can make the cells find the damage faster. We can heal muscle faster, which would be a great result for everyone. Now, whilst I was doing this piece of work and trying to understand the protrusions of the cells, we got very interested in understanding the actual formation of these little blisters, these blebs. And so I write, wrote down a lot of mathematics to produce a simulation that could, could produce a bleb. Now, the equations are very, very complicated and it's not doing very much. But you have to go through this step to really understand the system you're working with. Because once you have this complicated set of mathematics, you can then start simplifying. You can say, well, actually, do we need all of this? Because it's really defining the shape of the cell. And we know the shape of the cell. What we don't know are the forces. So if we fix the shape, we can generate the forces a lot easier. And if we can simplify, then we can do more with the model. So the idea is that we take the cell, we simplify the mathematics, but it still produces the same outcome. We can put that cell on a flat surface. It can start producing blebs and then it can start moving. So we can start understanding the motion of the cell directly from the protrusions that it forms. Absolutely beautiful. And now we want to compare this to data as well. So there are just two aspects of mathematical biology that I've worked on. There are many, many more different uh, applications. So I've recently worked on uh, the invasion of tumours in brains. So the idea is if we can say where the tumours are, we can help surgeons cut around the tumour and take out as, as much of the, the deadly cells as possible. Another piece of mathematics we've looked at, as I mentioned right at the beginning, is calcium waves on, on, on embryos. So as when, when you're uh, being fertilized, you have your egg, the sperm comes along, hits it, and then a calcium wave travels over the egg. We're trying to understand, again, what initiates that calcium wave. Because if we understand what initiates it, then hopefully we can help people with IVF because our IVF success rates aren't that great. But if we can understand what causes that initiation mathematically, hopefully we can make them better. Another piece of work, another beautiful piece of work we're currently doing is not in the body at all. It's actually ecological scale because bats in Britain are protected, but to make sure they're healthy, um, we have to find them. There are special volunteers who have bat licenses and they go out, try and catch the bats, check them over, make sure they're healthy. Are they pregnant? Are they feeding? Um, are they carrying disease? And they let them go. So what a mathematician is doing is trying to help find those bats because they're very small and they're very fast. So finding their roosts where they stay is very important to be able to say, are they healthy or not? So what we do is we're working with collaborators at the University of Sussex. They're putting microphones out in fields that collect data where the bats are at different times during the night. And then we're using that to predict where the central roost is. If you know where it is later, can you tell where it started from? Really, really fun piece of mathematics. And the results are astounding. So currently, ecolog ec ecologists are searching for roosts over areas that could be three kilometers in radius, you know, circular areas. You draw a radius of three kilometers, just think how big that area is. The mathematics is helping us shrink that down to 250 meters. Still not very small, but it's a lot better than three kilometers. The final piece of mathematics that we have looked at 
is trying to understand brain formation, in fact, more specifically, neocortex formation. Because the question here is, if you can understand how one brain forms, then you can tweak it. As I mentioned earlier, mathematics is all about what happens if. And then you can ask, well, is this how biology evolved? If we can produce one brain and we tweak it, does that produce a different type of brain? Then we start understanding what's the difference between a mouse brain, a monkey brain, a dolphin brain, and a human brain. And hopefully, we can understand it all the way down to the level of cellular production, cellular division, cellular death. So I hope I've interested you in my, my research. And, and moreover, if you are interested, come and think about doing a maths degree at Cardiff. Because in three or four years, maybe I'll be working with you. So I look, working, I look forward to working with you and see you in a few years.